a replica of what a Roman belt looked like. The King James is going to call this the girdle of truth. The New King James is going to call it the belt of truth. More modern translations call it the belt of truth. In fact, uh, look at verse um, uh, 14. Stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. I apologize. Uh, New King James says girded, but it's the same idea. It is a belt that is designed to hold everything else up. One of my favorite paradoxes is a paradox by the name, uh, a philosopher by the name of Epimenides. And Epimenides illustrated what Pilate said back in John 18, 38. He said the paradox of saying there is no truth is that there's no truth in that. Because everybody says there's no, th no such thing as absolute truth, which means simply that there's no truth. And he said, it's kind of crazy. Now, John 18, 38, when Jesus was being interrogated by Pilate, the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the people that were prosecuting Jesus were saying that what he's doing is he's trying to incite a riot. He's rebelling against the government, rebelling specifically against you. And when he's rebelling, you need to kill him. And so Pilate asked him, are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus didn't say anything, hardly except it is as you say. And then he asked the question, what is truth? Well, that's what we're going to try to see about tonight. In this war, this war will not be won with anything but the basis of truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time tonight. We pray that as we study your word, we'll have a better knowledge of the truth. Father, sometimes we forget that there are people in our world that, in communities that don't even know the truth. What they think is the truth is just what they've accepted. Help us, Father, to not only study the truth, but to also share it with others before it's eternally too late. Please forgive us of our sins. Please bless us tonight. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, the one thing he's going to do is he's always he's always going to go after the truth. And what I wanted to show you was is that all of the weapons that we're going to spend time looking at in the next few weeks, all of these weapons cannot be supported without this gird or girdle or belt of truth. There are five of them, if I counted right, that are defensive weapons. Two of them are offensive weapons, and sometimes they are offensive weapons. But the one we want to look at tonight is the belt of truth, that girdle of truth, because you see, what that girdle of truth is going to support is all the vital organs in a Christian's life. That's why a Roman soldier would wear the things that he would wear. Because they are necessary in this war. So as we look tonight, I want you to look first of all with me to John 8, 32. Jesus makes a statement there, a bold statement, but it's still true. You will know the truth, and the truth will do what? Enslave you. Well, that's what some people think. It'll, it'll make you a slave. It'll, it'll, it takes the fun away from you. You have to get all serious about the truth and 
you have to get all fuddy duddy and you're having fun, you must be sinning. Lord doesn't love you. Lord doesn't care for you. I know that you have been told that he does, and I know you've studied some scriptures, but you know, if you've had the week like I've had, the devil says, you ever wonder sometimes, and I have, where we get that concept, if you've had the week I've had, <laughs> I don't know why people get so ruffled about it. Every Labor Day, it's like this. I kind of liked it when I was a student because that was, that was one of the fastest weeks. You'd start on Tuesday and get done Friday, and it would be like, wow, where'd the week go? Then you had to go back to Monday. But the Bible says you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Well, look at John 17, 17. Jesus said in his valedictory address, that is right before he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he talks about he and the Father are one, so he prays for all that they may be one. Sanctify them in your what? Truth. Your word is truth. So the word sanctify simply means you're a Christian, but you don't get that title until you do something miraculous until after you die. That's what I'm told. I didn't read that in the scripture. You know what I read? You know what I read in the scripture? Sanctify them in what? Your truth. Now, what is truth? Your word is truth. Now, I could have added Psalm 119, 176, or I'm sorry, 119, 105, which says, Your word, or, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I often think about when I'm in this building and one of the greatest things they ever put on cell phones is a flashlight. But before we got the ability to have cell phones and all these apps, have you ever tried to walk across this building in the dark? My knees, my toes have screamed out because I've run into pews. But if I told you tonight, you know, if you want to wait till it gets dark and walk across here, you're not going to run into any views. When you hit that first pew with your toe or hit that first pew with your knee, your foot, you're going to say, you lied to me. Oh, I'm sorry. There's no truth. There's no, there's no absolute truth at all, especially when it comes to spiritual things. There's no absolute truth. It's kind of whatever you want to do. That's not true. <laughs> that isn't true at all. How about John 18, 37? What is truth? You know, he asked that question. What is truth? There are a lot of people that would like to know the truth. They love to know the truth, and they do. The problem is they don't know the whole truth. I'll, I'll explain what I mean. If I walked out here and I'm standing in front of the building or I stand on the porch and, and make it where both sides of traffic could see me, and I put up a sign that said, God is not real, Jesus is a liar, and the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. I'd have somebody pull up here and I'd have at least one person. I don't know who it'd be. Dwayne, I thought you were a preacher. I am. Where you preach here at the Church of Christ? Yes. 
And you're telling me God's not real? That's right. You're telling me Jesus did, Jesus was a liar? Yep. The Holy Spirit doesn't exist at all? Yep. Oh, no, wait a minute. I can show you in the scripture right now. Now, they may not know all of it, but they know some form of it. Now, I would never do that unless I've lost my mind. Because God's very real. Jesus was, is, and will be the Savior. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. So don't go on thinking I've lost my mind. I don't have much of it left today. Yes, but don't think I've lost it. But how about the meteor things? How do you become a Christian? Well, uh, all I know is you got to believe. We had a guy one time, we were looking for a new preacher. And he came up to me and he said, can I try out for the preaching job? And I went, no. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, because I know you. <laughs> He said, well, I'll just tell you what I believe. I said, that's why you're not going to get the preaching job. He didn't believe the whole truth. Now he's realizing the entire truth. That's why this is so important. This has nothing to do with being right. That is self-righteous. All I want to do is figure out what's right. Romans 2, 2. Turn over there with me, please. By the way, there's hundreds and hundreds of scriptures we could have put in here tonight. But he says, but we know that the, that the judgment of God is according to what Dwayne Springer thinks. Romans 2, 2. We, we know the judgment of God is what Dwayne Springer thinks. I sounds ridiculous when I say it, but how many people really think that? Not necessarily me, but themselves. I don't have to do any worship. I don't have to do any praying. Prayer is not powerful. Really? What happened in Revelation chapter 11? How long? What stopped? all of the noise in heaven for about 30 minutes. Now, whether it was a little 30 minutes or not, we don't know, but what stopped it? Prayer. Prayer. No, he says, we know that the judgment of God, do we know that the judgment of God is coming? Yes. Is it something we can avoid? No. It is according to truth against those who practice such things. What, what things is he talking about? Go back to verse 24 of chapter 1. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what was against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, their whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who do them. 
I cannot believe what that retired Marine told the police in Lakeland, Florida, why he killed a mother and a dad and three siblings and three kids. One of those was an adult. The other sat there and pretended he was dead. And when they asked him why he, they didn't, he didn't even know him. They didn't know him. And when they asked why he shot them and killed them, he said, God told me to. Now, whether he had PTSD, I don't know. We're, we'll find that out later. But you know God didn't tell him to do that. But you know the devil will help people use that to blame God for it. And the one that is not to be held responsible is God. Now, why is this truth so important? Why is it that, and, and, I, and I'm just using this as a illustration. I'm not great and wonderful. I'm saved by the grace of God. But why is it that I can turn around and I can debate somebody over the Bible for two and a half hours when they're trying to convince me their doctrine is wrong? Am I great and wonderful? I'm going to repeat that. No. But I'm not going to sit there and I'm not going to have somebody tell me, once you're saved, you're always saved. I've told you about this. I had a young man, he tried to convince me. And I went on the offensive, started asking him questions. Others have said the sinners, you say the sinner's prayer and you can be saved. No, it's a great start. And I love what Kevin Fox said about the once saved, you're always saved doctrine. He said, wouldn't it be nice if that were true? And I think some members of the church believe it because they don't take God very seriously. If they took God seriously, they'd be here. But you see, truth's not that important. Really? What did Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 say? Speaking what in love? The truth in love. Now, let's be honest. We've always spoken the truth. What we haven't always been too good at is speaking the truth in love. We will snap at somebody. We will bite their head off. We will yell and scream at them. We had a member of the church here who did more damage to the church than anybody I know. But he would go and he would start acting like he was the preacher. In fact, went to uh, one of the members here, former members here, he's moved away. And, and he told me, he says, Dwayne, he says, you can't believe what he was doing. He was in there trying to shove the gospel down their throat. And finally, he walked in and, and he says, boy, it got real tense real quick with some people. And he, and he heard him and he says, well, wrath, wrath on you, wrath on you. He condemned them all. And they were starting to get really irritated. And finally, they asked a member of the church that said, is he the preacher there? And he goes, no, you'd like the preacher. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But you'd like the preacher. He's a lot nicer. But the damage that we do sometimes and our quest to help somebody be saved is more damaging than getting them saved. And, and we get some, some new convert, and we're, and I'm going to tell you, just being honest tonight, we're not too good with new converts either. We'll turn around with a new convert who's struggling with learning, and we'll turn around and we'll vilify them. And we'll say, something. we'll say, you know, Brian, I do not understand why Dwayne just cannot get this. I just don't understand why he doesn't get this. We'll get what? We'll get the Holy Spirit. You mean you got the Holy Spirit figured out? You got him figured out? 
Well, no, I didn't mean that. Well, why in the world, if you're struggling with the uh, with the subject of the Holy Spirit, why are you struggling with the person of the Holy Spirit? And why are you condemning somebody who's still struggling with it? You know what we tell, you know what we've told new Christians? What you need to do is you need to go study the book of Revelation. That's not going to get anybody to grow. I love the book of Revelation. But you got to do some other work to understand the book of Revelation. I like what a friend of mine suggested, and he suggested to a new convert, study the book of Mark. Mark was written for you and me. It's not that the other three aren't important, but it was written for you and me. What is the design of speaking the truth in love is to grow up. I liked what a preacher at, um, I think it was in Memphis, Tennessee. Was it Wade Hodges? I hope. Anyhow, he brought in a recliner. You know me, I'm always saying we need to get rid of these pews and get a recliner. You can send your money. No, I'm just teasing. And he said, I want you to see this lazy boy. He said, they don't call it working boy. If they did, they never sell a one. In fact, Chevy, to illustrate the point, Chevy sold a car or tried to sell a car in Mexico. And they couldn't figure out why they couldn't sell the car. Nobody wanted to buy this car. And, the, and they went and they started asking people who spoke Spanish, why didn't anybody want to buy our car? He said, because of what you call it. I said, well, what's wrong with what with the word no va? And he said, that means no go. It doesn't go. Nobody's going to spend money on a car that doesn't go. So they went and renamed it something else and started selling cars. Grow up into him. Look, that lazy boy is there. But our bodies were never designed. And this hurts me to say. I hate this. Our bodies were never designed to sit in a lazy boy. Our bodies were never designed to sit for long periods of time. They were designed to move. And I get reminded of that when I sit in my lazy boy a little too long. Brienne gripes and complains that I get selfish with a chair. Guilty as charged. But that right knee of mine will start Mm, it reminds me I got to get up. <laughs> I got to move. We grow up. The problem is if you don't grow up, you don't know where you are spiritually. I have a student today that he's on the verge of getting into serious trouble. He's got potential. We all told him that. And I don't know that he believes it. Because what he wants to do is do some ornery things. I'm hoping he follows his older, not oldest, but I'm hoping he follows his older brother. His older brother, when he finally got it, man, it was like a light bulb. And it was awesome. This kid's grades at the high school were phenomenal, respectful, talk with you about maybe something that, some homework that he needed to get done. And it was like, what happened to you down at the middle school? <laughs> What happened to you as a freshman? I don't know, mister. Super guy. I'm proud of that kid. That's what we're talking about as a Christian. Grow up. Now, what does God want? God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the what? The truth. We're going we're to look at why. People don't come to the knowledge of the truth here in a little bit. But he doesn't want anybody to perish. He sent the mediator, the man, Jesus Christ, so that the truth could be known. And by the way, what, what institution is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth? That's the church. 
if the church isn't teaching it, then we're in trouble. Paul said, all, in, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16 to chapter 4 and verse 5, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, thoroughly equipped for what? <laughs> and then my pages would stick. Sorry. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, chapter four. I charge you there before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the popular opinion. No, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and the turn away aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. When Peter was addressing the concept of this truth, 1 Peter 1, verse 22, going into chapter 2, since you've purified your souls, in doing what? Obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flowers falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Of course, one of my favorite passages is 1 John 1, 5. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. Your joy may be complete. But if anyone walks in darkness and claims that he's a Christian, he's a liar. He doesn't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son cleanses us from all, all sins. If we say we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar and his word's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And then he goes into chapter two, talking about that defense attorney that we need. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father who is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, for the entire world world. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 21, it is a tall story. And what I mean by that is a very difficult story to accept. If you don't get involved in it, it won't be. But to the Jews, 
the story of the cross is what? A stumbling block. To anyone who's not a Jew, it's what? Pure, pure foolishness. One man dying for the world? One man dying for the world? Yes. That's the story. That's the truth. And yet, why is it that we have people who don't, uh, don't even accept the truth? Well, it's because the devil has attacked the truth. I mean, you, you don't have any idea what some, some stories, if you saw a picture, one of my favorites, and I didn't put it in here, and I should have, was uh, about the dog or the, the uh, sheepdog that was out in the water and had a hold of this lamb by his neck. And what it looked like he was doing in one picture, they cropped it, and it looked like he was killing the lamb. When you opened up the whole entire picture, what was that dog doing? That dog was trying to save that lamb's life. And sure enough, when that dog got that lamb to shore, dog let go, Lamb kind of did like this, shook, shook himself off and went on like nothing ever happened. You don't know what's going on in the truth, but I guarantee you, you know God's truth. If the devil's going to attack truth, where is he going to start? He's going to start at Genesis 3. And he goes to and goes to the weakest part of Eve. He goes to what she's looking at. She, he goes to what she's exploding or blowing up in her mind. And that is that tree, that one tree. God said, of all the trees in the garden, you can eat any tree you want. But the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you can't eat it lest you die. So, what does he do? He's more cunning. He's more crafty. The first thing he brings up is that tree. Can't you eat of anything you want? Well, yes, but we can't eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, and if we touch it also, we'll die. Oh, you won't die. No, no. You're going to be like God to know the difference between right and wrong. And so she took the fruit, gave it to her husband, and he ate it. And when men turn around and say, as I was bringing this up the other day at Chris's funeral, when men try to blame women for this, I remind them it took a little bit for the devil to trick the woman. It didn't take Eve anything to trick or to get her husband to eat it. So don't think you can sit in a position of superiority. And the first thing Moses writes is they knew they were naked. They didn't know they were naked. They didn't know any better. And if they did, they didn't care. But they knew they were naked, which indicated simply they were sinners. And God placed them out of the garden. Then you get over to number 16. Now, this almost sounds like, well, why would you put this in here? Because this is the story of Korah and his 250 followers who get mad at Moses. Moses has been the only leader, just like it is today. There are people who fight and squabble over power. Moses didn't necessarily want the job. He took it, but he it took some convincing. So Korah and his bunch, they're going to rebel. And Moses, first thing he does, he's, he's smart. He's been at it long enough. First thing he does, he prays. 
And he tells Cora and his bunch, show up this time tomorrow. And then this word went out the next day, do not go anywhere near Cora and his followers in their tents. And the only time we know of this phenomenon in scripture, if you can remember another time, help me out, is where the earth opened up, swallowed Korah and his bunch, the 250 followers of Korah, and then closed it back up. And you wouldn't have known the earth was open. The reason, because God said, I want you to know Korah is not the leader. Moses is my leader. Yeah, but Moses got a little arrogant, didn't he? Not really. Moses was an angry man, wasn't he? Yes. I mean, look what he did when he got mad at, at Aaron for making the golden calf, Exodus 32. And God pointed it out to him in the book of Deuteronomy because you got mad and you took those tablets and threw them. You're going to cut your own tablets this time. Ooh, God is not to be messed with. And then you get to Matthew 4. You can put in Luke 4 with this as well. The devil doesn't change. Whatever your weakest point is, whatever my weakest thing is, that's what he's going to attack. Well, the Spirit has led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, and Matthew writes he was hungry. Do you blame him? I don't. I'd be hungry too. I have people who hear who hear me when I say I, I really don't eat lunch nowadays at school because there's there's not enough time, and then then th there's there's not enough help in the cafeteria. And like today we had a fight, and 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 people were up in the cafeteria, but there's just not enough help, and that's just the norm. But when I tell them I don't want to eat, usually don't eat lunch, I eat supper. Have you ever seen people try to feed you? I appreciate it. Don't misunderstand me. But I had one guy trying to give me so much food yesterday, tried to buy my tried to buy my supper, and I said, no, I'm fine. And when he kept insisting on eating a cookie, I went ahead and ate a cookie because I'm I eat cookies, but I don't eat them every day, and I don't even eat them uh, as much as others. But I appreciated it. Don't misunderstand me. But I wasn't as hungry as Jesus was. And so when the devil says, command these stones to become bread, the question that I have for you is, if the devil is all powerful, why didn't the devil do it? Two reasons. Number one, he couldn't. Two, who would Jesus have been serving and worshiping? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what he said. It is written. Well, takes him up on a high pinnacle. He tells him, look, if you fall down and worship me, the angels will come and minister to you. He quoted scripture. I heard somebody say one time, the devil doesn't know scripture. Oh, don't say that. Don't believe that for one second, people. The devil knows scripture better than some most people do. And he quoted it. And Jesus told him, you'll not tempt the Lord your God. Then he takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. He said, these will all be yours if you fall down and worship me. Well, what's the lie in that? Number one, the lie was <laughs> he didn't, the devil didn't own those kingdoms. Jesus already owned them. So he says, you will worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And so the devil left him and never, ever tried to get him again, right? <laughs> Luke 4.13 says he left until an opportune time. 
One of those opportune times was this, the adulterous woman in John 8. Another time was when he was hanging on the cross. He could have stopped it all and we would have understood. But you recall what Hebrews 12, 2 says, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And of course, we looked at Ephesians 1 a couple of weeks ago, but I want to bring this back in for just a couple of minutes here. Because I still find it intriguing for me personally that I can read this, that I can study this, that I can get it in my heart. And I can walk out of here and forget I'm chosen. I can walk out of here and forget I'm adopted. I can forget I'm redeemed. I can get I'm forgiven. Now, just on that one alone, I, I understand the others. But on that one alone, that's where my weak spot is with Satan and prayer. And he blows it up. Did you see what you did? Did you see how you offended that lady the other day at the hairstylist? Did you see what you did? Oh, my golly. You, I'm telling you, I was so embarrassed, and I was so this and this. And he didn't just let it once. And well, you're right. I, I messed up. You remember when you messed up 25 years ago? And you remember what you did? I'm hoping after a man died this past week, that offended my younger brother to keep him from going to church and Bible study. I'm hoping that now he's dead, he'll go back. I don't have very much hope, but I've got hope. Because I'm telling you, this guy can preach a better sermon than I can. He's got the facts down better than I do. And one day it's going to germinate and he's going to have to do something. He's going to have to do something. But if I can attack the truth, you know what? I have rights. God, I have rights here. You cannot tell me that I have to be obedient to you. You don't understand. I have rights. I have absolute rights. And this is why I tell kids one of the biggest detriments, one of the most harmful things to our society today, and it was good legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1965, 1964. Great legislation, but it taught several generations, I'm entitled. You see, I'm entitled to one of these. It is my God-given right to have a cell phone. It is my God-given right to have a computer. It's my God-given right to have a television. It's my God-given right to have all the toys. It's not my God-given right to be obedient to God. Now, does that sound silly? <laughs> Very silly. But the devil is gonna attack us tonight. He's not already attacking you. He will. And he will, rem he will hope you forget tonight that you're chosen. Now, I, I like all of those things in Ephesians 1. But what I especially like is being chosen. I like being chosen. I was telling our social worker the other day, I said, you know, I hated, they said, what game did you hate when you were a kid? You know the one. I hated Red Rover. I hated when they'd say, Red Rover, Red Rover, let Dwayne come over. Believe it or not, I was 80 pounds soaking wet then. 
I never could break through. And they'd laugh and I'd get mad. Shouldn't have got mad. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know better. I said, I would love to go back and play that game with them now. Wouldn't you? I'd love to go play that with some kids because I know how to take them out. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. We had a good laugh. But being chosen is pretty awesome. And being chosen by God is even more awesome. And folks, that's what we have to convince the world about. They are going around thinking God has totally left them. That God has totally abandoned them. God doesn't care. And the Bible says totally the opposite. Interesting how people think God does not care. When they hear John 3, 16. You know it. I know it. One of my first memory verses. And they still go around believing that God does not love them. They've been deceived by the devil. He attacks the truth. He'll make it half truth. For example, just give you one example. Mister, I don't know how you can say that God doesn't approve of marijuana and marijuana use. Now, we're not talking about medical. That's a whole other category. Didn't God create marijuana? Mm-hmm. Then why can't we have it? I said, did God create poisonous mushrooms? Yeah, but I don't like mushrooms. Did God create poisonous mushrooms? Yes. So are you going to go eat a poisonous mushroom? Well, no. I'd die. There's your answer. There's your answer. I don't follow. You just want an excuse to be able to smoke marijuana. That's all you want. And I watched the famous country singer that we always associate with marijuana, Willie Nelson, and I watched him in an interview a while back. He reminded me of my father-in-law, the second one that, or the only one that I had, but my mother-in-law's second husband. <sighs> He's had to cancel some concerts because he can't breathe. But marijuana doesn't hurt you. Really? Really? It's no worse than cigarettes. And what do we know about cigarettes? They'll kill you. Bible's not very authentic because it's an old document. I was told that. I said, there's a problem with your statement. What's that? The one that old wrote it is not old. What do you mean by that? You're telling me God's old? Well, I, I don't know. I know. God's not old. Therefore, his doctrine's not old. His law is not old. His truth's not old. And so what is he always going to do? He's always going to attack the truth. He's always going to attack the truth. Because that way, you and I won't have eternal life. Anything you want to add to that tonight, please? Or per Ladies and gentlemen, sorry. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, glory and honor be to your name. Thank you for giving us the book called the Bible, which contains truth. Many people reject it, and it seems like it's growing at an epidemic rate. We pray that we won't. Bless us tonight as we go home. Keep us safe and in your care, and forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you again for being here tonight.